Pac-Man painting. Let's talk about it. There is few 3D production workflows that gives you as quick and satisfying feedback as hand painting. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently because you don't see a lot of hand painting anymore. Obviously, WoW is like the golden standard and you have studios like Airship or Riot who still do hand painting, but by and large, the industry is favoring PBR stylized art, Fortnite, Overwatch, Valorant, that sort of thing. And I love that stuff, but I'll always have a place in my heart for hand painting. I feel like hand painting really helps you learn color theory and light and a lot of art fundamentals that you would maybe learn from traditional 2D painting or 2D illustration in 3D um, because you have to think about all that stuff, right? You don't have a light source. You don't have any guides to really tell you where your specular highlights should go. It's all up to you as an artist to make those decisions to make your asset pop. And so that's why I really like hand painting. It's just fun. And not only that, like I mentioned, the feedback that you get from hand painting is so immediate, right? You put a stroke down and you see the result. And so I really like that about it. I like that it's a fast turnaround. And so that's what we're gonna take a look at today. We're gonna take a look at my full process of hand painting a weapon from start to finish. The tool of the trade for hand painting is a program called 3D Coat. Now, some of you might be familiar with 3D Coat, some of you might not, but it's a really powerful program that lets you do all kinds of things. You can hand paint in it, you can texture in it, UV, retopo, sculpt. It does a little bit of everything and not widely used, but for hand painting, it is the standard. And, you know, some other software is starting to catch up. I think the brush engine in Substance is getting pretty good, but it still just doesn't come close to how it feels to paint in 3D coat. It's almost just like Photoshop, very fast and responsive. And, and it's really necessary for hand painting to have that immediate feedback. We'll go over the basics of 3D coat, just like the basics to get you hand painting. We're not gonna go over the whole program, just what are the key things to know? And that'll help us get started and start painting. Now down in the description below, you can download this sword model and all of my textures and everything for this project so that you can texture along if you're interested in taking a stab at hand painting yourself. You can go along with this video and kind of practice and see what I do and compare your work to my work. And you know, I'm not like the best hand painter. It's just something I do recreationally and I think it's a lot of fun. So yeah, so I encourage you to take a stab at it as well. Now I did model this sword in Maya and you it in Maya as well. I thought about including that full process in this video, but it's nothing crazy. It's a very low poly sword. Here's just a few snippets so you can see basically the, the small chunk of the process to model it. Nothing wild. Um, if you are interested in like seeing that kind of process, let me know in the comments down below and maybe I can do more of that in the future, but yeah, it's a pretty basic model, all things considered. And I'm just following along with a concept that I made earlier in the week and kind of figuring things out there. Now, we're gonna go ahead and export that model as an OBJ so we can import it into 3D Coat. In terms of UVing, I mean, there are things you wanna consider, like what you want mirrored, what you want unique. And there's always a balance in having the most texture, re texture resolution you can get while also having unique pieces. So. You'll see some areas I choose to mirror, some areas I kind of keep unique. And since this is a long video, I'll touch on some of that stuff as we're going through it and try to explain. And there's even some areas that after I finished, I wish that I had mirrored or changed the UVs on. Um, so there's also a learning experience there. Now, why don't we go ahead and look at the basics of 3D Coat and how you actually get started in terms of hand painting in 3D Coat. Now up in the top left, we have a brush shape panel, right? You've got like a pointy brush or flat brush and just kind of your basic brush presets. We're gonna use pretty much a wide hard circle brush for this entire thing. I don't change my brush ever. I just use a circle brush and that's it. You know, once in a while, if I'm trying to add a little bit of texture, I might use like a texture brush, but by and large hand painting, I just use a simple hard circle brush and that just keeps it straightforward and gives me a lot of control. In the bottom right, you'll see we have a layers panel, layers blending, all that sort of stuff. This is just like Photoshop where you can have multiple layers to work on top of so you can work non-destructively or however you'd like to work in regards to that. The layers can blend with all your basic normal blending options uh, and you can also change the opacity of those layers. You have different brush alphas you can choose and up top you have your basic immediate brush settings. 
things like opacity, smoothing, and depth. Some of these are for actual painting. So if you're doing like PBR painting, you could choose like the glossiness, the specularity of your brush. We don't need to worry about any of those settings because we're only doing hand painting. Now we're gonna go ahead and import our model. You can go to file import and you'll see there's an option called model for per pixel painting. We can just go ahead and choose that. And it's gonna bring up a new menu where we can select our mesh and we can select our texture resolution. There's a whole bunch of other settings there, but we're just gonna ignore those for hand painting. Those are very specific to different cases and they're not something we need to worry about to get started. Now, when you import your model, you'll see it's got basic shading and similar to like Maya and other programs, the number keys can change the visualization of your mesh. So you can hit four to go wireframe. I think two is to go flat shaded. Uh, there's other keys that show you different modes like lighting or, or that sort of thing. So if you were doing more advanced painting, you could worry about those, but we really just want to use four and two to be able to have our model flat shaded with no lighting and occasionally look at our wireframe to get a sense of where we're working. I've also included a little speed indicator in the top left to show what speed we're watching the video at. I think that might be useful to kind of understand. Now you can also see that Redico has a lot of other tabs like Retopo, UV, and Sculpting. So you can like look at the UVs. You can actually even change your UVs in 3D Coat if you want. Like that's, that's a whole, it's a whole UV editing suite. You can UV your mesh from scratch in 3D Coat. It's pretty cool. It's not something I use a lot, but I know people that do UV and 3D Coat and it's just like any other program. You have a couple other things. You've got like your paint bucket. There's like cool spline tool. Um, I did want to show in the paint bucket, there's what is called a gradient option. And when you hit that gradient option, it gives you these two points and you can choose a color for each point and then apply a gradient. So sometimes when you're trying to like take a character and kind of make his feet darker and like lighter up top, you know, you can make a layer and use that gradient tool to fill and then, uh, you know, multiply or, or screen or whatever blending option you want to do to kind of add that extra depth to your character. So I, I like that a lot. Let's talk about actually painting and hand painting 3D objects is a lot like just painting in Photoshop or, or drawing or doing an illustration where you're making a lot of color theory choices to make your model pop and make your model look great. And so to start, I like to put down a base color and you know, it could just be a dark version of the color you're gonna apply, but I like to kind of get some different hues in there early as possible and so I'm going to go ahead and choose kind of a darkish yellow, burnt yellow, orange color that I'm going to fill the whole model with using the paint bucket tool. And then as I start to lightly paint on top of that, hopefully I'll retain some of that color in spots. So it just kind of comes through and adds more depth and variety to the actual metal and, and just kind of makes it more interesting overall. And so once I fill in that dark color, I'm going to kind of choose a neutral metal color to build on and I'm going to just choose like a lightish desaturated blue, bluish green, something like that, whatever kind of works for you. And I'm going to start just lightly painting the sword blade. Once I have that established, I'm going to choose a slightly lighter color and I might push the hue. So it's always a good habit to not just like choose a blue hue and go lighter and darker of that one hue and that's it. You know, you can kind of go a little bit more towards the green or a little bit more towards the yellow, like however you want to kind of add depth to your model. And so for my highlights, I'm making them a little bit more greenish, I would say, so that they stand out a little bit from the neutral base color that I'm choosing. And as I go hotter and hotter in my highlights, I'll push more towards a different color so it really stands out. Um, if you stay too close to your your one base hue, it's gonna end up looking really monochromatic. And we wanna add a lot of variety. Now you don't wanna go too far where it just looks like a rainbow parade or it just doesn't make any sense. You know, we're kind of trying to imply that there's objects that are reflecting on this metal that have different colors and that's reflected in the specular that we're painting. So I'm just going ahead and choosing that different hue and I'm staying very much in a mid range right now. So. I'm not going too dark with my shadows and I'm not going too hot with my highlights. I'm kind of just trying to rough out where those highlights and those shadows are going to live. So just going a little bit and then we'll build on top of that and we'll build on top of that. So we'll add more contrast as the process goes on. We don't need to immediately add a ton of contrast. This is really just about establishing our forms and establishing the general 
lighting and directionality of our lighting and that sort of thing on our object. So that so that's what you see here is me really just kind of figuring out where do I want those highlights to sit on the blade? How do I want the highlights to look on the gold parts? So, you know, I have this large V shape on the handle of the sword. And I thought it would be cool to kind of really reinforce that that V comes to a point. And so you can kind of imagine the light hitting the one side and kind of creating a really sharp point down the middle and then fading off. And then I might hit some other areas with light light too. So there's like some reflections or secondary light sources hitting it. Uh, same thing for the base around the gem, just kind of giving one side a really sharp highlight so that it really reinforces that diamond shape that it has uh, and just adds a lot of interest. Now, real quick, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I blend in 3D coat, um, basically just like how you blend from one shade to another shade. And I kind of want to say my process is unconventional. I'm not sure. I've never actually talked to any other artists about how they kind of do blending and stuff. And Maybe this is totally scuffed and other artists will just be like, what are you doing? But uh, it works for me and I don't mind it. And what I'm basically doing is repeatedly color sampling nearby areas to kind of gradually blend the hues from one to another. And I just want to show you what I mean by that. So now in 3D coat, you can actually smooth your brush. So if you do a stroke and then hold shift and paint, you can kind of smooth it out. And it works okay, but something that I really like to do is if I put down a color, so I'll, I'll build it up a little bit and then I'll sample the edge with the color picker and then sample again and then sample again. And so I'm gradually going from the hottest color to back to my original base color. And I'll, I'll basically always have my finger on V sampling to help me blend. And so I'm kind of picking areas that I think will work to help me blend in between those shades. And this way, it's not just like a perfectly smooth blend. It kind of is rough and has a lot of like imperfections in it. And I can spend as much time cleaning those imperfections or leaving them as I want based on the style that I'm trying to get. But I did just want to share kind of how I handle this so that you understood my process because it might not make a lot of sense just watching it. But yeah, this is, this is basically the technique that I use to blend from colors in 3D code. Now, one of the really cool things with 3D Coat is how easy it is to send your textures from Photoshop to 3D Coat and back and forth. So if you go up to edit uh, and export to external editor, you can send your textures to Photoshop with all the layers that you have in 3D Coat and make changes. So say we do this base layer. You can do this stuff in 3D Coat, but it's a little clunky. So I like doing it in Photoshop. You can send it to Photoshop, adjust the levels or contrast or color of your layers, hit save, alt tab back over to 3D coat and you'll see it update in 3D coat. So you can see me just adjusting the levels and brightening it up a little bit, just to make it a little easier to work with because I felt like it was a little dark. And then we can send it back. Now, now it won't hold adjustment layers. So you can't just do like an adjustment layer levels and then save it and bring it back to 3D coat. It won't recognize that. So it does have to be on the layer. So it's a little destructive, but overall I think it works well. You can do that stuff in 3D coat, like I mentioned, but it is a little clunky. So I've kind of trained myself to not work that way, but you totally could. One of my favorite parts of 3D coat is the hide tool. It's very intuitive. And kind of works how a high, how you would just expect a high tool to work, which you can hide individual polys. And you can use the plus and minus on your keyboard. I have a wonky keyboard. Um, or you can go up to hide expand selection and it will grow that selection. And it, it knows like if you have multiple unique pieces that build up your mesh, it'll keep expanding and just hide that piece instead of interfering with other pieces. So makes it really easy to like isolate areas so that you can kind of focus and paint on certain spots. 
Um, I just like it a lot. It's a really nice high tool that helps you hand paint certain areas or get in crevices when you're kind of having trouble when everything's exposed. Um, so definitely something to use. Now, as I move forward, I'm going to kind of use the gold top of the hill area as my test bed to like start testing brighter highlights and testing more variety. And you can see I'm also trying to get more color in there because I never want everything to just be one hue. I, I like having a lot of subtle color in all of my metals and surfaces. And so you can see like I'm choosing a, a kind of desaturated blue and throwing that into the shadows and throwing that into spots of the gold just to kind of break up the yellowness and redness of the gold and give it more variety. And you know, I'll even throw like greens or pinks or yellows in there just to kind of add a lot of subtlety. Like there's these different reflections and surfaces in the environment that are impacting the look of your metal. I um, mean, it, it helps give it more realism. And you can see as I work on the highlights, I like to like first, you know, choose a very subtle highlight where I paint very roughly like that's that's covering a large surface and then I go a little hot hotter and I paint a more narrow spectrum of that specular and then I go hotter and I paint an even more narrow section of the specular on top of that so kind of building up to the hottest point of the specular instead of just like over a whole big chunk it, it kind of subtly comes together to meet the final specular shape next you'll see me kind of roughing out how I want to approach the cracks and damage for this. And it's very important that your damage that you hand paint isn't just like a line or like a thin line. You really want to sell those as part of the design and something for your eye to look at. Too often I see people paint really like narrow slits for their damage. And when you step back and look at it, it just doesn't look good. You really want the, those pieces of damage to tell a story and have visual interest. And so I like to make them really chunky and really exaggerated. And when you do that, you really want to make sure that you're defining the surface of that crack. And so that's why you see the upper half of the damage has a darker paint. And then the lower half is the highlight. So you, it makes it very clear that the damage has like a V shape to it. And then I also come in with a highlight and paint the edges of those cracks to really pop it and give it visual interest. So when you pull back, you kind of get these hot spots around the damage and it draws your eye to it. And I think it adds a lot of interest and it's a way that I really like to add damage and cracks. And you can also see that on the edges overall. Like I like to take a hotter color and kind of go along the edges. Now, you don't want that edge detail that you do with the specular to be even. You know, kind of make it hot and then taper off Une like kind of vary the stroke size and vary the intensity of the spec because if it's just a solid line of one color it's not going to look realistic or natural it's going to look very artificial and so you know i kind of want a lot of variety and variation so it kind of makes it feel like the surface is uneven and maybe the surface is a little worn and you can see that and you can see that in my stroke like it's it's very kind of random and mushy and doesn't look amazing up close, but when you pull back, it feels a little bit more natural than just like hot yellow line, if that makes sense. I'm just continuing to slowly build up my highlight forms. So just making my highlights a little brighter. Also starting to define the edges more with the highlights on the edges. And just really build up the forms and the depth. So kind of having the outer edges of the weapon be darker and then come to a, a brighter point in the center there. And also kind of figuring out different areas where my highlights can hit that it might not have hit before. So like the angled area of the bottom of the blade, making sure that has a really good highlight on the upper half. Um, same with the top of the sword and then also just adding more color to my highlights in the main area of the blade in the main area of the hilt and really trying to push the variation in colors like i wanted the wings on the hilt to be gold and then the sub wings underneath it to be kind of be like a copper or a bronze and so making sure that i'm getting good color variation there that makes sense 
So playing with different areas where I can add some lighting or specular and kind of add the shape to it. And you'll see I'm I'm painting with pretty high opacity. I think it's at like 89% right now. Um, but a lot of this is like hand control. And I, I feel like going lighter and building up is better than like trying to just do a really hard full blown stroke, like just being really light and adding lots of strokes because as we add those strokes and add that directionality of our hand, it kind of adds detail in a way because instead of it being perfectly smooth, which is totally a viable style if you're trying to make something very smooth and very clean, that's a different direction. But for me, I like the part I like about hand painting is kind of having that roughness of your hand in the underlying painting so that it kind of adds all this subtle, subtle detail and you can use your stroke directionality to really uh, to really kind of guide that and and give you that kind of depth and visual interest um, organically, which is really cool. You can see that I'm referencing my concept a bit to just kind of figure out what I want to do with the handle. And you'll see later in the video, I actually end up deviating from the concept and make some, making some changes because I felt like the handle was too basic. So I eventually actually go in and add some like gold bands and stuff just to give it more interest because it wasn't just, it wasn't really working for me. It felt unfinished, but you'll see that way later on in the video. And you'll see the process for pr pretty much every material is the same. It's having that base color, filling it in with a neutral color of that material, roughing in where the lighting is going to hit, defining the cavities and the edges, and then building on top of that more and more and, you know, figuring out uh, your roughness, but by hand painting it, like how bright and sharp, like you can see on the leather here, highlights aren't going to hit as hard as the gold or the steel does so kind of making sure you're having a variety of materials that you're painting to really contrast each other and show what they are and i might not have as many random colors in like the leather as i do like the gold or the steel i still like to add like greens and different hues in there just to give it more interest but uh yeah it kind of varies based on each surface and each material. At this point, I'm basically starting the process of slowly tightening up my forms and shapes. So locking in those edges that kind of really define the shape and uh, form of each surface so really defining this kind of dent that the steel blade has as it, it folds in towards the gold um, and starting to push those highlights even further and also adding a little bit of damage here or there so you can see I'm <clears throat> choosing the directionality of some of the damage on the blade and don't just add damage like randomly like oh a slot a slit here slit here slit here slit here Try to tell a story or kind of think about it and have follow through for your damage. So like, don't just have damage on one piece and then nothing like as it continues flowing across your object, like have it so that it kind of tells some sort of story. And so that's where like I have these two V shapes towards the bottom where maybe an ax or a blade or something chopped in right there and chipped both sides of the blade. Um, things like that. So just trying to add a lot of interest and variety with that damage because that stuff adds a whole different dimension and layer to your weapon. I mean, you might make a weapon that doesn't have any damage at all and it's brand new and clean, but I like to make things that are kind of battle-worn and used, even if it's like a prestigious or like a legendary weapon or something, it's still seen a lot of wear and 
use over the years. So kind of adding that stuff in. And this is also kind of where you're, as an artist, balancing your level of detail. So maybe having areas that have more detail and then having a clean surface and then having a spot where there's more going on. So you kind of have these patches. Now you don't want it to look too patchy, but right, it's all about that balance, having a good distribution of detail through your model. And damage is a way you can kind of do that. Sometimes when I'm adding wear, it's not always just big chunky damage. I like to do kind of like highlight damage, I call it. So like you'll see where I take a lighter hue and I basically kind of draw like thin lines or lines that kind of like start chunky and thin out and start chunky again as they connect from one edge to another edge. And think of these almost like scratches. Like these are like just scratched, scuffed areas of the metal that the light is hitting and reveals that scratch. And it just kind of adds a different level of detail in terms of damage. The damage doesn't always have to be these big chunky pieces. I have these smaller ones. And I also do them as like little scratches and stuff along the edge. So, you know, again, so that edge line isn't straight. It's kind of like has different shapes and different chunks and pieces coming off of it that show wear and show that that edge isn't like perfectly even and polished. So just another really good tool. And then I can also go in with an even hotter color and pick areas where I want the edges to really pop or really reinforce that light is hitting it in a certain way and making it stand out. And so you can see I'm having the light on the blade where the edge meets the damage be really hot and a much brighter blue. You can see the hue of the blues like where there isn't really much light hitting the, the edge of the blade. I have it kind of just a desaturated blue and then I'm going for a much, much hotter color where the highlight is. So having that depth in your hues and your tones, so it's not all just monochromatic. Starting to add in a lot of my smaller detail. I had these kind of circle shapes throughout the gold on the blade. So I'm going in and roughing those in and much like the damage, it's like a three step process I mean, more steps, but the rough basis is kind of rough out with a line, the, the shape, and then I'm going to add the dark side of it and the light side of it. So then I'll go in with a darker color and define the edge that's not getting light along those pieces. And then I'll choose a lighter color and have a highlight that's kind of reinforcing that. Creating a process and a methodology for you to work is going to help you get more consistent results much quicker because it can be overwhelming to just be like, oh my God, I have to paint all this thing and there's so much detail and there's so much stuff and you just get lost or you, you start doing too much too soon. Creating this buildup pro using this buildup process, it balances 
the creativity and the artisticness of it while giving you a workflow to follow and stay consistent. So, you know, choosing that base color, building a neutral color on top of it, working on your shadows, working on your highlights, adding in color variation, adding in damage. Think of these as like steps and parts, right? So to keep yourself from getting overwhelmed, try to break everything down straight try to break everything down strategically so that you can work on each of those pieces individually and not feel overwhelmed. You can see I'm going in and adding some different color hues to the top of the blade. I'm trying to mix in some like greens and reds that it feels like there's some different colors being reflected in the steel and just add a bit more depth and interest to those areas. And right, I'm not going, I'm not exaggerating these colors a lot. Like it's not like, oh, that's red or that's pink. They're very subtle so that when your eye is looking over the surface, you just see these little variations. You just notice a little bit of green here, a little bit of pink here, and it just kind of adds it. Now, if you're trying to make something very reflective or very, or you're trying to paint something that specifically is mirror-like or something like that, where you want really bright colors and variety, you can totally do that. But we're going for more of like a wow style, impressionistic kind of hand painting on the metal where we want it to be reflective and shiny, but we're not trying to replicate real life necessarily to a, a perfect degree by any means. I'm repeating most of what we just talked to for the very bottom of the sword, which I largely ignored up until this point. And you'll see, you'll see during this section, I deviate from the concept a bit where on the concept, the center piece on the bottom, I kind of had an engraved diamond. And when I painted that on the model, it just felt like there wasn't enough detail or no depth there. So I ended up doing this kind of like double layer thing instead. And it gives me a result that I was much happier with seeing in the model. And That'll happen often when you're translating from a concept to 3D. There's things that look like they work or look good in 2D, and then you start doing it in 3D, and you're like, it feels too flat. It doesn't feel like there's, it feels like there's something missing. And now in production, you might be given the free freedom to deviate, or you might not. So sometimes you just have to stick to the concept, even if you're not completely happy with it. But in our case here, this is just for us and for learning and for practicing, so we're allowed to do whatever we want. And so I'm not worrying about staying perfect to the concept. I'm trying to stay true to the concept, but I'm changing details and changing shapes where I feel like it makes sense for the final result. Thing at this stage too you've probably noticed things that i've decided to mirror on the uv so like the diamond gem shapes for example is just the same mesh in the same uvs where i just duplicated it and put it on the bottom so that i was able to just reuse that for both spots and that let me get more resolution on the gem rather than having to have two unique ones now if there was some reason that you wanted them to be unique like they're a different color or you needed a gradient at the bottom so you had to have it be its own UVs and sure, but for this, I thought it was fine to keep them mirrored. You can see me kind of replicating everything we've talked about up until this point, adding the edge wear, scratches and damage, adding different depth and stuff. And you can see this is what I talked about a little bit ago where I wasn't happy with that diamond shape. So going in and kind of making a raised diamond instead, and it kind of just adds an extra layer of depth. And that's what's kind of cool about hand painting is you can add smaller details that look like they would change the shape of the model, but they're just hand painted. Now you can't go overboard or it's just going to look flat. But for small areas like this, where it wasn't feasible to actually add the geometry to have these pieces, it totally works. And when you step back, you're like, okay, that adds extra depth and extra uh, height to the model that it didn't have before, which I think is cool. <laughs> 
These sub wings, I thought about mirroring and giving them overlapping UVs, but I decided not to because I felt like I could control the directionality of light across the whole wing object more by having them separate. And they didn't take up that much UV and they didn't take up that much UV space. So I think it works out fine. Wanted to add a big gash at the bottom of the sword, like it took a big hit somewhere, like a chip. So you can see that there. And don't forget about like the middle sections here too as well. So I'm just kind of not going to go crazy with detail on these, but making sure that they have some color and some variation. So they're just not like flat brown pieces. And maybe add like a little damage or stuff, but just want to add some visual interest to those areas. Here's a, here's a great example of that tonal variation from the metal to the highlight where most of this is like red, brown, burnt kind of colors. And then I went much more yellow on the highlights. And as a result, you just kind of get a really cool range and a really cool value change over the whole surface with having those yellowy highlights on that red background. It, I think it really pops and gives a lot of visual, visual interest. Whereas if we kind of kept the highlight the same hue, but just lighter, it would have worked, but it would have felt a little bit more flat. So that tonal variation really helps give you more interest. You can, you can see that I'm also adding a bit of a shadow under each of the wings. And since we are mirroring some stuff, we're cheating our highlights a bit, right? So if the entire thing was unique, we could say, okay, the sunlight is from this direction and all the highlights are gonna be this direction. But since we're mirroring things like the wings, obviously we can't have the highlights both in one direction because of the mirroring. So, you know, having unique pieces that do have a strong directionality and then having mirrored pieces that are a little more neutral in where the light hits them, that's okay. It's not going to totally break your suspension of disbelief or anything. Um, you know, overall, I, I think it still works fine. Like, I'm not like, oh, the light's all wrong on this. Now, the more you think about light and the more you kind of do have that directionality, it, I mean, it subconsciously affects how you feel about it. But for a sword or a weapon like this, I don't think it's a huge deal. You can see now I wanted to add more contrast and get the weapon to pop a little bit more. And so, I basically duplicated the object and added a blend mode. I think I went with lightness to kind of bring out the highlights while keeping everything else more the same. That just kind of helped add a little bit more contrast and brightness to it. Uh, and I'll play with that more in Photoshop too. In Photoshop, I'll play with the saturation, the levels, the final look, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, 3D code, I can get all the painting done and the overall all result very close. And then just kind of those final color tweaks and final contrast tweaks in Photoshop. You can see too, trying to just add more color variation, like on the underside of that blade, I added some yellow. Um, in the crevices and stuff, I might add like reds or on things like copper or gold, I might even add like greens to the like dark shadows. So it kind of almost looks like, uh, it could just be a reflection or it could be like oxidation. Like when you see like oxidized surfaces that kind of have green in them. I'm um, just kind of adding a lot more depth and interest. This is really like my detail pass now. I'm really taking everything I did and just pushing it further. So reinforcing the variation on those edges, um, adding more color depth to the surfaces, adding more damage, smaller damage, um, things like that. Just kind of finalizing and tightening everything up. And uh, also start even just in between those areas, I'll play with different kind of stroke hardnesses. So some areas will be soft and then I might purposefully do a hard stroke that kind of emulates like maybe a specific reflection or something. So you just kind of have this variation where there's harder areas and softer areas. And you can see in the blade where I have strokes that are very defined, like you see a subtle sharp line and then there's a soft area. So there's not really a science to that. It's kind of just playing around with it and adding different brush and stroke variation to give it visual interest. And 
that's the hard thing about trying to teach this is that obviously there's the workflow that I spoke about, you know, shadows, highlights, midtones, damage, and building up. But the actual artistic direction of those decisions kind of comes up to you and is very experimental. And that's what's so great about hand painting is it's so fast to experiment. You know, with other 3D stuff, you do a high poly and then you bake the high poly and then you go in substance. And at certain stages, you kind of get locked into your decisions unless you go back and do a ton of rework. With hand painting, you can just try something and you're like, oh, that didn't work great. Just scribble it out or erase it or just paint over it. No big deal. And I do that all the time as I'm trying to block things out and try different things. And, you know, if something doesn't work, it doesn't feel like I wasted a lot of time working on it because you can build up and retry stuff so quickly and, and so fast that it's a very, very satisfying art style and a very satisfying way to work. You can see just adding detail to those edges, adding different kind of stroke variation to the highlights. Here's that gradient that I spoke about. I'm trying to play around with adding a gradient fill and then making the bottom slightly darker. I don't want to go too far because I'll lose all the detail that I lost, but a very subtle lighter to darker gradient on top of everything kind of can give you extra depth. Um, Works a little bit better on like characters because they're much taller and you can kind of have much greater range of that gradient, but it works on weapons too. And here, here again, you can see on the blade as we look up closely to the blade, you can see areas where I deliberately kind of painted strong lines to break up the surface of the metal and add kind of reflection variation and stuff like that. You can kind of see and sometimes it's just a line, sometimes it's like a squiggly shape, sometimes it's a color. Uh, but overall, it adds to the final look. When you're happy with your final look, you can go to Texture Export, and you can choose All Layers Color, and that'll export your texture as a PSD with all those layers, so then you can take it into Photoshop and continue working non-destructively. You can also just export a final color map if you want to work that way too, not a big deal. And here's just kind of all my layers. We're just clicking through each layer and building up one by one to see the changes over time. You can see that was kind of flat at first, and then we started to add more highlights and more damage and more wear. And as we added those layers, that's how we brought in more contrast and more color variation to get to the final result. Here's that last touch up I told you about. As I was looking at the final result, I wasn't happy with the outcome of the handle. And so I decided to add some more metal detail to really push that. And this is also an opportunity to show one other trick in 3D Coat that we didn't talk about, which is masking. Now you can hold control and click on a layer and it'll actually mask your paint in that layer, which is really cool because it helps Kind of paint especially on like thin surfaces you can kind of isolate it and paint the highlights and the edges without 
overlapping into your other stuff. Most of the time, I don't mind if my brush kind of overlaps into other areas because sometimes that subtle sloppiness adds integration between your surfaces. Like, oh, it's kind of a reflection. It's not a big deal. But sometimes you just want to be able to mask an area and work very specifically on that area. So that's where control clicking that layer comes in to uh, isolate those areas and just focus on that section that you're painting. And then you can just hit control D to deselect that selection when you're done. Boom. There we go, guys. So that's the full process start to finish of hand painting a sword. Obviously, we had some of it sped up, but I wanted to make sure that we included every bit of it, even if it was time lapse a little bit so you could see how I think about things, how I jump around, how I build up the surfaces. And uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Now, again, if you want to try this yourself or take a stab at painting this sword, go ahead and check out the description below. You can download this off Gumroad. It has the model. The concept art that I made, uh, I inc I'll include my texture file so you can pick them apart and look at my stuff up close if you would like. And yeah, give it a try. If you do end up taking a stab at hand painting this and you want me to check it out, you could use the hashtag hand painted heart on Instagram and maybe we'll collect some interesting results that people of the community have done. And maybe in the future, if we do get enough, if enough people decide to take a stab at this, we can make a video and take a look at everybody's weapons and their, their interpretation and their attempt at hand painting because I bet there's a lot of really, really talented hand painters out there. So that would be cool. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing and hitting the thumbs up. I really appreciate it. If you have ideas for videos that you would like me to do, leave a comment in the comment section below. Um, if you have feedback or extra questions, I try to get to that stuff as quickly and as frequently as I can. I really appreciate it when people leave comments and are interested in the videos that I make. It's awesome. Uh, thanks guys. I hope you have a great week. Do some hand painting because it's awesome and I will see you next time. Take care and don't stop creating. Bye-bye.